Okay, excellent. We have a good a crowd. Um, we're all online. Fantastic. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, good morning to our speaker uh, tuning in from, uh, from the US. It's a pleasure to have you all with us in today's session of the Gerhard Center's webinar series, The Aftermath of COVID-19, a New Social Impact Ecosystem. The Gerhard Center launched this webinar series in April of this year with the aim of discussing concepts that are currently not mainstream and may or perhaps should become mainstream in a post-COVID world. Today is the 20th session and it's a pleasure to have with us Phil Buchanan, president of the Center for Effective Philanthropy. Uh, the title of Phil's talk today is Philanthropy in a Crisis, The Truth Revealed. Phil Buchanan is a passionate advocate for the importance of philanthropy and the nonprofit sector and deeply committed to the cause of helping foundations and individual donors to maximize their impact. Phil has led the growth of the Center for Effective Philanthropy for over 20 years, I think, Phil, if I'm not mistaken. And Almost. he made the Center for Effective Philanthropy a leading provider of data on effective philanthropy, particularly in the United States. Phil is the author of a book I would like you all to read. I urge you all to read. It's a highly acclaimed book with the title, Giving Done Right, Effective Philanthropy and Making Every Dollar Count, which was published in 2019. He is also co-author of many Center for Effective Philanthropy research reports, a frequent contributor to the Chronicle of Philanthropy, and an author of op-eds that appear in nothing else but the Financial Times and the Boston Globe, uh, very influential uh, newspapers in the United States. Phil was named in 2016 uh, Nonprofit Times Influencer of the Year. And we are very happy to have Phil Buchanan with us today to help his record influencing some of the thoughts that will guide our thinking on philanthropy in a post covid world. Um, I will start us off by asking Phil, first thanking him very much for taking the time to be with us, and then asking Phil a number of questions. Um, we will have about 20, 25 minutes to listen to Phil. Uh, you are welcome to send your questions in the chat room. Carrie Mann from the Gerhardt Center is with us monitoring the chat room and taking note of all of your questions that we will then um, start to pose to Phil uh, at the end of his 20, 25 minutes uh, conversation with you. So feel free at any moment during his uh, conversation with me to send you your questions in the chat room. Uh, thank you, Phil, for being with us. Very much looking forward to- Thanks for having me. Um, let me start us off, Phil, by asking you, um, in your book, um, which I have just noted, you list a number of fallacies and you debunk a number of falsehoods about how to give, to whom, and how to measure the impact of one's giving. What does new data collected by the Center for Effective Philanthropy tell us? about the challenges and opportunities confronting philanthropy in today's world. Thanks, Noah. Thanks so much to Dr. Ali and uh, Kerry Mann and everyone at the Gearhart Center for um, having me be a part of this webinar series. And thanks, Noah, for that very kind uh, introduction. I mean, I think the biggest myth at the highest level is that uh, nonprofits should operate like business, uh, whatever that even means. I never know what that means. Is that like the dry cleaner, uh, Volkswagen, uh, Enron, Apple, Google, right? It doesn't really mean a lot to say uh, like business uh, or that philanthropy uh, should be like investing and philanthropists should act like investors. And from those 
misconceptions I think many other sort of fallacies follow. So if you think of nonprofits as needing to be like business, then I think you'll underestimate how difficult it is to actually assess performance for a nonprofit. So uh, performance measurement in the business world uh, is finally uh, boiled down to what's in the financial statements, you know, profit or ROI. In the nonprofit uh, world, it's completely different. There is no universal measure against which you can compare the organization working on education to the organization working on uh, climate change. Um, so that, that's one example. Uh, another one is if you, if you take the mindset of, okay, I'm like an investor. Well, what does that mean? Like an investor wants a single organization that they invest in to grow very rapidly and they care really only about the success of that one organization in a zero sum competitive context. In philanthropy, the dynamics are completely different. Uh, and often, um, sometimes it does make sense for nonprofits to scale up, but often the most effective organizations, and we're seeing this right now, uh, at least here in the United States in the wake of COVID, are community-based with, uh, they're small, and, and, and their smallness helps them to be trusted by the uh, communities that they serve. And so, uh, the scale of those organizations isn't necessarily the goal, and it might be to collaborate uh, because no one organization is going to accomplish uh, anything alone. So, you know, you asked about what data, you know, we're seeing. One of the th things that we found in a survey that we conducted um, last, last month, no, it was in May, and the report came out in early June, of nonprofits is nonprofits right now in the United States anyway, the ones we surveyed, are experiencing something that no business leader would ever understand. <laughs> An increase in demand for their services coupled with decreasing revenue, right? So in business, uh, demand and revenue go hand in hand. But here you have nonprofits in the most challenging situation. And the ones that were particularly uh, facing difficulty were those serving uh, disadvantage, historically disadvantaged populations and those doing uh, direct service. So we've seen already 80% of this nationally representative uh, set of respondents had dipped into financial reserves. A majority had cut wages or benefits. Uh, just under half had or planned to lay off staff. Um, so organizations are on the financial precipice and the ones that are hit hardest are the ones that are most uh, needed now. And so that's why you know my feeling is if you have, if you're fortunate enough to have resources as an individual or whether you're a foundation, an institutional giver, um, now is the time to step up because the COVID crisis, it, you know, people keep saying here, I don't know um, if they're saying this so much in other parts of the world, but they're saying it's exposing the inequality uh, that existed. Uh, which of course is true, but it's worse than that. It's, it's deepening that inequality, not just now, but potentially for generations. Uh, if you think about uh, people who already um, were facing barriers, who now, um, you know, African Americans, for example, are be being infected and dying at rates that are multiple times that of white Americans in this country. And there's a lot of, lot of reasons for that. So, it's great to see um, places like the Ford Foundation, Noah, like step up with an additional billion dollars uh, and a number of other foundations have done the same and I hope that more do. Um, and I think individuals um, need to step up too. It's an unprecedented time. And I, I keep reading articles about, um, I, I'm sort of surprised by the articles I see saying, well, you know, we should be optimistic because, uh, you know, donors really responded um, uh, in a big way in the month or two following or um, giving is up from donor advised funds relative to last year, as if that is even a relevant comparison. I mean, this is so unprecedented that what we need is an unprecedented uh, response. And I, I keep saying to people, I don't think anybody who was in a position to do something is going to look back at this time and say, oh, I wish I'd done less. Uh, 
Um, Phil, thank you very much. This is a strong um, opening for, uh, for our conversation. Yes, COVID has made it very clear that we need to double down. Um, and it's not easy because philanthropy organizations as well as in individual high net worth uh, 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 individuals are not necessarily spared from the COVID crisis. They right. have also suffered from the COVID crisis. But you made an excellent point about showing that this is the time uh, to double down, if you can. <laughs> right. This is the time to double down. Um, then I would go on to ask you a question that we often hear from the nonprofit sector. And that is, uh, how do we prioritize our immediate response to COVID? versus our longer term issues. And some of them even go about to say, if the, if the uh, donors keep jumping from one issue to another, although COVID is not just an issue, it's, it's a serious game changer. But it's still somehow, its effect on the nonprofit sector is, how do we, if you keep, if you keep asking us to jump and, and, and change and refocus and whatever, we, we will not be able to, uh, to, to cope with that. How do you see it happening in the US uh, sector that you know very well? Uh, this prioritization between seizing opportunities to make a difference in immediate responses as much as in the longer term systemic changes that the nonprofit sector focuses on in between crises and doesn't yeah. want to lose that focus during right. the crisis. Over right. to you. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's such a big risk um, that, uh, you know, so of course, right now, um, we want to encourage folks to respond, you know, to the tremendous need. And sometimes those needs are um, frequently needs that, in my view, government should be addressing, but sometimes isn't. Um, and so philanthropy steps in to alleviate suffering or in this country right now, there is a welcome and overdue um, sort of focus on racial justice. And I saw a big announcement from Open Society in the New York Times this morning about a major commitment uh, to support uh, Black-led organizations. And, um, and this, is, this is great. Uh, and also, of course, you, know, you have um, organizations that are not working on something maybe directly connected to COVID, like arts and culture organizations that have essentially had to close the doors, their earned revenue has stopped coming in, and their you know viability is in doubt. And this is why, you know, I think if you kind of do the math, the only answer is for folks to give beyond what they normally would. And 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 this is uh, you know I in the book I talked about. Um, the whole debate in, in, the, in the world of foundations about uh, perpetuity versus spend down. And, uh, and I think that there's no one right answer, right? Like I, I actually think perpetual institutions, um, you know, long time horizon institutions have a lot of value because um, they can build up knowledge and expertise and they can take a long view. But one of the unique assets they have is the ability to step up their giving in a counter cyclical way when other revenue sources decline. And I, I, as I said before, I'm, I'm very pleased to see that some foundations are doing that. I, I think not enough are. Um, and, and so I hope that more will. And similarly with, with very wealthy individuals, I've read some accounts of the levels of, giving among billionaires worldwide in response to COVID, that, that is kind of depressing actually, uh, in, in, in the sense that um, there, is, there are resources there to, to do a lot more. So the only way we avoid what you're talking about is we've got to grow the, the philanthropic you know, pie as hard as that is to imagine uh, right now to counter, uh, to counter the, the challenges. The other thing is that, um, I think that 
we have to think about how we support organizations differently. Um, one of the things that you know, drives me mad and that I write about in the book is all of the ways in which we undermine the success of nonprofits by giving in these ways that don't make a lot of sense. Like saying to the food pantry, um, here's my contribution, um, but don't use it on rent. Don't use it on salaries for the staff who coordinate the volunteers. Only use it on the potatoes and the broccoli. Uh, and this doesn't make any sense because they can't serve the potatoes and the broccoli without the people being paid to recruit the volunteers and without uh, the, the space that they have. So let's, let's, if we trust an organization enough to give them our resources, we should trust them enough to allocate those resources. And what was interesting is in the wake of the uh, pandemic, this became blindingly obvious, right? Like, oh gee, nonprofits are gonna have to do things differently than what, we, uh, than, than what they had been doing. So for example, I've, I've written about a, a, a small organization serving um, immigrants in Seattle called World Relief Seattle, and they help recent immigrants to the United States get a job, get their feet on the ground. The executive director said to me, uh, her name's Chitra Hanstead, and she said, all of a sudden, people who had been laid off from their jobs in the hospitality industry were showing up because they needed food. And where did they come? They came to us because we were the organization they trusted because we helped them when they first came to the United States. She said, well, we didn't, you know, we're, we, we're not a food bank, but we realized we have to become one for the time being. So they partnered with a local food bank and started distributing food uh, at their location. And um, this is the kind of thing that, you know, one example of the way suddenly people had to change. And then if the nonprofit says, well, but I can't use this donation for that because it's restricted to this, this doesn't make any sense. And so we've seen a group of hundreds of foundations. And again, I think Ford actually initiated this and my colleague, Hillary Pennington, who's uh, on the board of CEP said, let's pledge that we're gonna operate differently in various ways. And I'm talking about foundations, but, but it applies to individual donors too, right? Who do things like um, restrict gifts in ways that don't make sense or judge organizations based on overhead rates, which are not a very good measure. And so anyway, these foundations came together and they made this pledge, which is great. And kind of the question is, um, why does it take a pandemic to actually change the dynamic and trust those organizations on the ground with the knowledge that's rooted in community to do their work. Um, the first chapter in the book, as you know, is uh, it, it, I, the title is um, something like Unsung uh, American Heroes. And I'm writing about nonprofit staff who I think around the world are unsung heroes doing work that is, takes everything it takes uh, to be uh, an executive director of a nonprofit that it takes to run an equivalent sized business. And then it's also way harder. And so we need to recognize that and support these organizations in a way uh, that really provides them what they need to be strong. Uh, Phil, in a sense, what you're saying reminds me of this tension we have about the nonprofit sector between professionalism and, and activism volunteerism. Yeah. Um, or civic engagement versus professionalism. Yeah. Um, in a sense, we do, the donors, philanthropy foundations, as well as a high net worth individuals, um, want to work with accountable institutions, professional nonprofit organizations. Right. But when it comes to providing that unrestricted funding to help those organizations build their institutions, we react as if, oh, aren't you a bunch of volunteers who can do anything and everything with very little? Right. Uh, talk to us about how the U.S. philanthropy sector and nonprofit sector are dealing with this tension between we want to work with professionals because they are accountable, but uh, we also think they are volunteers and should do, do it out of the goodness of their heart. 
Right, right. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I write in the book about um, a nonprofit in Houston, Texas, that's a community health organization. And I wrote about them because, I mean, they're, they're great, but also organizations like that are in every community, right? And uh, there are nine staff, and it's the place where people in that neighborhood in Houston, uh, there's a lot of poverty, it's the place where they go when they're, when they're desperate, when they need help. And the staff there help people to sign up for um, uh, government programs that they might need help signing up for to get help with health care. They have a food pantry, uh, which, of course, you know, the, the need there has just ballooned since uh, mid-March. They provide um, uh, English language um, education, other services. And um, the people there, you know, it takes skill to do what they do, uh, to build trust with clients, to understand the different programs and who's eligible for what. Um, these people are not highly paid. On the contrary, uh, the and and um, and I, and Kathy Moore is is the executive director, and I I spoke to her on Friday just to check in with her, um, and you know, in the first in the first weeks, um, there weren't very many COVID cases in Houston. And so what they were dealing with was just the economic impact, uh, the, the layoffs, um, the need for food. Now uh, she's seeing um, many COVID cases in, in the community. Her staff is still coming in every day. Uh, you know, they're putting themselves at risk when they load up cars with food. I mean, they're trying to do everything in as safe a way as possible. But the whole notion that that work should somehow be done only by volunteers. Now, they are very reliant on volunteers. And one of the problems that they have is that um, most of the volunteers are retired older people who understandably haven't been showing up uh, since since mid-March. So, so I, I think... Um, I don't think there's necessarily a tension between being rooted in community um, and, ha and being paid and professional. Uh, I think those things can go hand in hand. And I think related to this, you know, one of the big problems, um, and I, I write about this in the chapter of the book about strategy, is, is this um, notion in philanthropy that um, we, the donors, know best what others need, that we can come up with the right strategy for a group of people or a neighborhood or a community um, without really engaging them, you know, and this is, and this leads to all kinds of, all kinds of terrible failure. Uh, and what we need to understand is that the best uh, philanthropic and nonprofit efforts are rooted in real understanding and connection to the people that you seek to help. Um, just one one story I tell in the book to illustrate that, which you know is just based on the press reports at the time, is um, you know, and I don't mean to pick on on Bill Gates or the Gates Foundation because they've done a lot of important work in global health, but uh, they had an initiative in 2016, um, in which they uh, Bill Gates announced that they were going to try to um, encourage uh, poor people in developing countries to raise chickens. Uh, and there was a blog post on the Gates Foundation uh, website, uh, and the byline said, by Bill Gates, and it said, um, this is the best way out of poverty uh, for poor people, and it even had the line, if I were poor, that's what I would do, I would raise chickens, um, which is just, you know, you can kind of talk about just sort of how weirdly tone deaf it is for a uh, one of, but, but, you know, and again, I, I think Bill Gates has done a lot of wonderful things, but this was not one of them. And uh, so they partnered with Heifer International to provide uh, chickens. And, uh, and the, the government of Bolivia said, we don't want your chickens. Uh, and the Minister of Finance was quoted in the Financial Times saying, who does he think we are? Some people living 500 years ago, uh, you know, and, and the headline in The Guardian uh, said something like Bolivia to Bill Gates, cluck you. Uh, and, uh, and so 
this is a, it, it illustrates the point that you cannot um, succeed if the people you're trying to help or the people between you and the people you're trying to help, whether that's grantees or government actors, don't agree that what you're offering is what they need. Uh, and it doesn't really matter if sort of hypothetically it makes sense. It has to make sense to the people you seek to help. And I think, um, I think that's just a mistake that we see being made again and again in philanthropy is to think we know better what will help other people uh, than the pe people living with the challenges themselves. Um, we are coming uh, very close to the time when we turn it over to our uh, um, participants to pose the questions to you, Phil. But maybe I'll ask you a final question and you can try to be brief. Uh, okay, <laughs> will do. It's a bit of an unfair question, but I'll, I'll ask it nonetheless. Um, All questions are fair. Um, <laughs> in, in crises of that kind, you are telling the philanthropy sector to act in an anti-cyclical manner, meaning when there is a global recession and everyone is worried about their endowments and their money, they shouldn't be conservative. They should double down because right. the nonprofit sector needs them now in that crisis. My question to you is the following. This creates momentary surges in mm -hmm. funding. And some mm -hmm. say those surges help the nonprofit sector pay, maintain contracts, maybe hire more to deal with the crisis. But once the surge of resources drops back, to either pre-crisis stage or somewhere in between, the nonprofit sector is again in a dire situation. Tell us from your experience about the American philanthropy sector, how, how do you deal with those moments of euphoria right. and then you know that it will not sustain? The nonprofit sector needs to do a lot more longer term sustainability planning, I would say. What is your advice to the nonprofit sector? Well, I have, I mean, I have a couple reactions and I know I'm gonna be brief, but first thing is people, people um, sort of beat up on nonprofits for not being more sustainable, but the oldest institutions in the world tend to be nonprofits, not, not businesses, right? Uh, it's, so, and, and as we see all around the world, many small businesses, you know, have closed up shop. So, and then the other thing people say is, is you know, you should really focus on earned revenue because that's more sustainable than contributed revenue. Well, it's certainly not true now. The, the last thing you want right now is to be dependent on earned revenue. That's where we're seeing the highest number of nonprofits saying in our survey uh, that I talked about before, which is on our website, that they're, they're, they've experienced declines, but they're also experiencing declines among large gift givers and small gift givers who are individuals. And then foundations have been the most stable source of funding. And I think the point that I'm making is foundations can step up when these other revenue streams are impacted, and then they can go back down closer to the 5% or whatever it is that folks sort of default to as the other revenue sources come back, which they will over time. Uh, and, and then it's also important to remember that the amount of money sitting in foundation endowments has increased dramatically because there, it, there will be future wealth creation and there will be new foundations. So when I hear sometimes, you know, I get to these debates with we, we work with a lot of big foundations. I'll get in these debates with foundation presidents and, you know, well, 35 years from now, you know, we're going to be a lot smaller if we spend out more now that, than we would otherwise be. Well, yeah, you know, that's true. But, but also, it's not, there will be other foundations, right? And if you're a little bit smaller than you would have otherwise been, but nonprofits that are crucial made it through uh, that otherwise wouldn't have, um, that's really important. And the woman I mentioned before, Chitra Hanstead at World Relief Seattle, she, she said something in my first conversation with her 
right after the, the pandemic hit, she said, um, think about what human resources people say about how much more expensive it is you know, to train a new person than to retain talented and experienced staff. She said, it's the same with us. If we're not here, we spent 40 years building trust with the immigrant population in Seattle. If we're not here in a year or two, it's more expensive societally to start from scratch. Fantastic. Thank you, Phil. Um, Kariman, um, over to you if there are some questions that we can take right now. Thank you so much, Dr. Noha. Thank you so much, Phil, for um, such a great conversation. Um, Phil, do you think that philanthropists were doing enough to address the root causes of systemic justice, um, systemic injustice, sorry, or were they just addressing symptoms and maybe in good faith they could be indirectly feeding and strengthening un, uh, unjust systems? Do you think that we were on the right track and the pandemic came to uh, distract us or a structural change was originally much needed? Thank yeah, I mean, I think it's both. I mean, it's, it's, it's both. Uh, so uh, I do think that there has been philanthropy that's been practiced in a way that's, that's sort of upheld and perpetuated uh, power structures, but there's also been philanthropy that has led uh, to greater you know justice and equity so um if you look for example uh and i apologize I, that my examples tend to be u.s focused just because that's where i am but if you look at the the criminal justice system in this country which is a um you know you can look at the data about the rates of imprisonment uh for people, you know, committing the same crimes, uh, the rate, the rates of arrest, the rates of conviction, and and break them down along racial lines, and and in my view, the only conclusion that you can come to is that it's a racist system, uh, and that it hit in and, and and yet there's also been some progress in the last ten or fifteen years in changing that still terrible system for the better, a lot of that progress has been supported by philanthropy. So the Public Welfare Foundation based in Washington DC, for example, has done, a, it's not that big a foundation, you know, f relative to like a Ford Foundation or whatever. It's, I think it's maybe $500 million in assets. I mean, it's a lot of money, but, uh, and they have focused on criminal justice. They worked on the issue of uh, uh, children being Im imprisoned uh, and, they worked state by state to try to change policy to make it more just. And they cut the rates of incarceration of children, of juveniles, by half in, in I believe, 12 years. You know, so this is real progress toward justice. You can look at other, other examples of, um, you know, support for expansion of, of civil rights in uh, or, uh, around the world. So there's not enough of that kind of philanthropy for sure, but... I think, I think there's a tendency to generalize, right? You know, and I probably fall victim to this too because I, I'm trying to, I'm trying to tell the story of, of the good that philanthropy can do. Uh, and it, but we have to recognize that there's just like anything, there's good and bad, and uh, and so um, I think what we knew, do need to do is focus more of our philanthropy on issues like racial justice and racial equity, um, and in fact. You cannot respond to this pandemic effectively without focusing on those issues because the data tells us that the impacts are disproportionately uh, on certain populations. And so the philanthropy that, that comes in response has to be informed by that reality. Thank you so much. Uh, Phil, you already addressed the, the issue of community engagement, but so let me ask you that. Uh, many donors okay. do engage beneficiaries in the process of decision making and strategizing. But sometimes it happens to get the buy in or to gain trust uh, from those communities, assuming that 
the donor do already, as you said, do already have the way to salvation and just need to get in, okay? Uh, it would be great if you can talk a bit about the need to change the mindset of stakeholder enga engagement to make it more about learning from the communities, not just bringing them around to gain trust. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Karaman. Uh, I, that is such a great question because the term buy-in uh, drives me crazy. And, I, and I, I write about this in the book in the context of... Um, well, again, actually, the Gates Foundation and their work in education, because um, I, I, I quote, you know, I think it's Melinda Gates at some point saying, we realize we need to do a better job of getting buy-in. And I think, no, it's that, again, assumes exactly to the point of the, the question that, that you've got the answer, and now you just need to convince folks that that's the answer. And, uh, and I think what is required is a deeper listening, uh, you know, to to people, um, and, and so um, that's very hard to do. Uh, you know, interestingly, speaking of the Gates Foundation, we launched with their support an initiative in the area of education um, called Youth Truth, um, and the origin of that um, experiment, uh, which has now become quite successful, was that we had, one of the things we do is survey nonprofits about their experience with foundations to try to bring real feedback to the table because foundations tend to be surrounded by people who tell them what they think they want to hear. They don't get candid feedback. So we had done this for the Gates Foundation and, um, and one person in part particular, uh, Faye Tversky, who, who is now at the Hewlett Foundation, was then at the Gates Foundation, is now on the board of CEP. She said, well, it's so valuable that you are bringing this feedback from grantees and, and also declined applicants to foundations. But what about the people who should matter most, the people whose lives we're trying to improve? And, and from that conversation came this experiment called Youth Truth, which surveys young people in elementary, middle, and high schools uh, about their experience so that education funders and school and district leaders can actually be informed by what the young people's experience is. We just put out a survey based on, um, based on a survey of 20,000 students who were learning remotely uh, during the, the pandemic about their challenges. And it's so interesting to me because like, you know, we, people talk about what parents want, which is important, and po all these policy conversations. The students have incredibly powerful insights about what works and what doesn't. If we would just listen, and it's true in every um, area of work. I mean, obviously there are some areas of work where you, you can't listen to the beneficiaries. Uh, if you're you know, working to protect endangered species, for, for example, uh, you wolves can't necessarily tell you how they feel. But if we're talking about uh, humans with the capacity to speak, we need to listen. Thank you so much. Um, digital divide has always been a reason for inequality. Uh, with the COVID hitting hard, this, the, the digital divide has already deepened the yeah. uh, inequality. Yeah. And with all those conversations romanticizing the fourth industrial revolution, we can expect that this gap would even be wider. Do you think that there is a, a role philanthropy can play uh, to bridge this gap? Yeah, I mean, that's such a great question and a great example of, you know, an existing disparity that has just become more pronounced in this, uh, in this uh, crisis. So it isn't just that we now are seeing it more, it's actually getting worse because we're more dependent on, on technology. So yeah, I think philanthropy has a role. And then I also think, and we haven't really talked about this yet, that we that we need to be we need to be realistic about the limits of what philanthropy can do, uh, and the fact that government and policy uh, uh, change is often required to really address these issues. And 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 I I I think that many of the biggest successes um, in philanthropy have involved some degree of policy change. Uh, and, and so, so I think that's, that's a really important element of, of effective philanthropy. And, and of course, it can be problematic um, if it's done in a way 
that undermines, you know, to the point we've been talking about again and again, the, the perspectives of the people uh, who are most affected, but, but it can be done in a way that elevates those voices, as has happened, for example, in the area of criminal justice, this, this can be very powerful uh, and positive. So I think that the digital divide issue is one that philanthropy can address, but I think there's also a policy and a government uh, role here. Um, and the big question of like, what is essential for um, any human, you know, to be a fully participating member of society? And what do we expect uh, our, our, government, uh, our governments to provide uh, for, for people at a baseline? Thank you so much, Phil. Um, with all the political tensions going globally, it is expected that the global aid to the South will come with political price tags. Something that used to happen in the past, but was uh, uh, more a global tension going on, it could be even more severe. What role can a good philanthropist play to make the civil society more resilient to such situations? Boy, I wonder if Noah has thoughts on this question as well, given, given your, your work, um, Noah. I, I, I mean, I, I think um, this, so the question is about the, the political tensions that exist. Can you, just, can you just clarify the question a little bit for me, Karimon? Sorry. It's, Sorry, it's expected it's a, that with the global tension, with the political tensions going on, uh, yeah big uh, big chunk of the aid will be politicized which will I make see. civil society is in a uh, you know very vulnerable situation yes okay. uh, what can private capital do to uh, to mitigate this uh, uh, risk i'm yeah. sorry if the question was not clear no no i i think it's clear question I, I i think i'm sort of stumped because it's such a hard question uh you know in terms of what i mean i think philanthropy can um push for um, transparency. I think philanthropy can uh, seek to build bridges across, you know, governments and across uh, political divides. But I think, you know, there are limits to what philanthropy can prevent in terms of, you know, corruption or politicization of aid, um, as you as you mentioned. And again, I, I don't know, Noah, if you would want to weigh in on on this, given the work of the Ford Foundation. Um, I'll have to take off my, my, my facilitator hat here <laughs> for, for a second and say, uh, yes, there are limits, uh, but on the other hand, there is also a lot that philanthropy does in order to mitigate against the risk implied uh, yeah. in this question. Uh, among the things that philanthropy does uh, these days, and that takes us back to your point, uh, Phil, about uh, how we should change the ways we give and we partner with the nonprofit sector. One of the ways that we are changing in this partnership is indeed to look at the accountability of those of the partners, how uh, good is their internal systems of, um, of measurement of what they do and how they do it. Not in a, in a donor partner uh, unilateral relationship, but for the sake of the credibility and legitimacy of the nonprofit sector that is in many parts of the world, including in the United States, right now undergoing such a massive attack of we don't trust you. Right. Bottom line is we don't trust you. So they cannot just sit there, listen to that, and say, and whine. They have to respond with very rigorous methods, internal governance structures, et cetera, that make them show that they deserve the trust. And here, many uh, philanthropy uh, uh, foundations support uh, that internal look into organizations on health, all sorts of health, financial and governance, et cetera. And we call that institutional building for the organizations. Uh, and as you said earlier, we provide the necessary resources they need to look at themselves internally and strengthen their own internal operation in order to deserve the trust uh, they need 
uh, against such a claim of we don't trust you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Noha. Um, Phil, what trends uh, have we witnessed uh, among next generation philanthropists in the response to support COVID-19 efforts? Is there something new, something unusual? Among, among younger donors, uh, next generation donors, I mean, I, I think, um, I don't know that I know how the differences in response are playing out yet sort of along generational lines. I think more broadly, um, you know, we have seen the many younger donors are impatient uh, in a way that can be both really positive, impatient for results, and also can sometimes lead them, uh, you know, down the road for, you know, easier quick fix solutions where there aren't any. Uh, you know, we've seen that with some of the the tech tech titan donors who uh, sometimes I think seem to believe that, uh, you know, disrupting poverty will be as simple as, you know, Uber and Lyft disrupting the taxi business. Uh, and uh, actually, it's, it's much more complicated. Um, you know, I think one of the things that a number of younger donors have pushed for is, um, is an approach to investing that, you know, seeks to align impact uh, and returns. And I think that there are interesting questions right now about um, the potential power and influence of both investors and consumers uh, on issues of racial equity, for example. Um, you see many companies making, uh, many uh, American companies anyway, making big announcements and global companies like Pepsi about uh, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars that they're committing to racial equity. Um, but then there's less information uh, sometimes from some of these companies about what they are doing internally or about their own, you know, choices about what products they sell and how. And, and so, you know, I think that in my lifetime, you know, I've never seen, um, and this is, this is the part of what's going on now that gives me some hope and optimism. I've never seen such an outpouring of, uh, concern about equity on the part of um, such a diverse group of people and so much questioning of corporate practices, of government practices, yes, of philanthropic, you know, foundation and nonprofit practices. And this is, this is a really good and healthy thing. And I, I do think that it is, it is folks you know, not only, but it is often folks in their 20s and 30s and 40s who are asking a lot of these, these questions, and then hopefully some older folks like me as well. <laughs> thank you so much, Phil. Uh, that was really insightful. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Noha, if you would like to uh, uh, wrap up. Thank you. Thank you, Kariman. These were excellent questions uh, that allowed us to pick uh, Phil Buchanan's brains. And what we got was some very important messages. Um, Phil started us out saying a very important piece of evidence that he's watching in the US, namely that the COVID crisis and the global recession have resulted in some um, contraction of giving, uh, as much as some great examples of doubling down. But the contraction in giving, ha and he's great to remind us of that, resulted in the nonprofit sector being hit hard. Its workers' contracts are in jeopardy, and the work with the beneficiaries and the vulnerable communities is at jeopardy. So doubling down in crisis is Phil's way to go in order to earn the claim of being effective philanthropists. The second message Phil gave us today is that don't get bogged down on the discussion between perpetuity of your endowment and spending it down. Worry about moments of crisis because they are moments of opportunity. 
There are moments when you can push the envelope. Help people with immediate relief as much as advocate for the root causes that made the crisis a crisis of that magnitude in the first place. So use the opportunity embedded in the crisis. He then asked us all as philanthropists and, and donors to ask ourselves how can we change the ways we give in order to empower and strengthen those we give to as organizations in the nonprofit sector. He gave some good examples of why this is important to think carefully about restrictive and non-restrictive funding. And if it's not restricted, it's better. It allows the organizations to become nimble, to react quickly, and to invest in the things that donors usually frown upon, such as professional staff, such as IT infrastructure that is becoming in COVID such an important means of communicating with the vulnerable uh, uh, communities that we serve. Uh, he Phil reminded us that deep listening is important, not for buy-in, but for real insights that affect the design of our work and the effectivity of our work. And deep listening is a skill that can be learned, and there are tools to do it. Finally, he said, after all is said and done, lim uh, uh, philanthropy has limited power, and it goes so far. But there are issues where philanthropy has been an effective advocate for policy change beyond philanthropy's own ability to move things. Policy change can make things happen, and philanthropy does fund the research and the evidence and the advocacy to inform policy change. Finally, he left us with a hopeful note that this is a moment like no other. The momentum is so great. Everyone is worried about inequity. Everyone wants to do something about it. So let's all roll up our sleeves and use some of the insights that Phil Buchanan mentioned today to deal with inequity. Thank you, Phil, for a wonderful conversation with you today. Thank you, Kerry Mann, for sharing with us so well and so articulately some excellent questions. Um, we are coming very close to the end of today's webinar. I'd like to invite all of the partic participants in today's webinar to um, come back again uh, and join in tomorrow's webinar with two ILO experts, Susanna Puerto and Jonas Bosch, who will be talking about the global initiative on decent jobs for youth. Um, thank you all. Thank you, Phil. Great pleasure to have you with us today. Thank you so much, Noah, and thank you. I want to echo the uh, thanks also to Kariman for, it's very difficult to actually wade through all the questions and uh, figure out which ones to ask. I've had to do that, and you did that very well. And thank you also to Dr. Ali and uh, to everybody uh, there for the opportunity to be with you. I really appreciate it very much. Thank you, Phil, for your contribution with us. Thank you very much for moderating. And thanks, Carrie Mann, of course. Very nice webinar. Thank you. Thank you.